Hey, Broker Nation. Welcome to the podcast today. I'm joined by Nick Hill and Daniel Folk. They are the two geniuses behind the Canadian Real Estate Investing Podcast. In this episode, I cover a conversation with them about the Canadian their, their predictions for the Canadian housing market, as well as interest rates. We dive into NAR rulings in the US and if, will it have an impact on the Canadian real estate? And also, I asked for their best advice on having a podcast because they built one from 6,000 downloads to 100,000 downloads a month. This is an awesome conversation. It's a little bit longer than my normal episodes, but it is jam-packed full of wisdom. And this was just a fun, fun conversation. Love these guys. And I knew Nick already, but Daniel, I just met for the first time. Awesome guys. I think you're going to really dig it. Hey, I'm Scott Peckford. This is the I Love Mortgage Brokering Podcast, the number one podcast for mortgage brokers to help you scale up your mortgage business. Uh, I'm the founder of this podcast. We started it 10 years ago, as well as BRX Mortgage, Bricks Mortgage, we like to call it. You can find it all about me. You can find me on socials. Look me up. Uh, let's jump into this episode, and I'll come back at the end with some thoughts for you. Hey, Nick and Daniel, welcome to the show. Thanks, Thanks for, having for having us, Scott. So I don't usually have two people on the show, but you guys are unique in that you have your own podcast, the uh, Canadian Real Estate Investor Podcast, which is the largest podcast for Canadian uh, real estate investors. So I'm quite excited to chat with you guys. Maybe before we get into it, though, Daniel, give me a little background who you are and and how you ended up here in like 60 seconds. Yeah. Um, my name is Daniel Foch. I am a real estate broker by trade, um, which kind of has led me in a, in a very uh, nonlinear journey. But I started with a family business at a university. Um, dad sold resident or sorry, my dad sold commercial property, mostly land to, to developers. My mom sold residential property. And so I kind of, kind of got a lot of exposure to deals it, it, in both ends of the market. Um, did an undergrad, uh, be common real estate. So I kind of had a institutional background, like almost analyst trained, let's call it. Mm -hmm. Um, once I got into the real estate space, started doing market reports as per, you know, what the Brian Buffinis and Tom Ferries of the world will tell you to do, um, got a knack for it. People really started li liking it, blended that with content. Twitter really took a liking to the charts I was putting out. And I kind of just like found my people there, um, which was, I guess, just people who thought the market was going to crash. And I was uh, happily wrong with them for, for decades, uh, for 10 years. And then, and then the market actually uh, did crash and, you know, the, the, kind of the, when the rate hiking cycle started and, and people in the real estate uh, industry started paying attention to what I had to say about that, I suppose, because for the first time in my whole life, I was right about, <laughs> about that. Um, and, and yeah, so, so now I work, um, as a real estate broker, but I, I actually, um, built the, the, uh, I was on the team that built the data science platform for the Toronto real estate board, um, which is actually just being launched like right now. So, um, and, uh, work in a research capacity, uh, consulting for developers on kind of like pricing strategy, market strategy for uh, condos, rental product, etc. Um, honestly, like my my role is mostly a consultant in today's world, and and uh, and then a content creator, um, and and that functionally boils down to just constantly doing research about what's happening in Canadian real estate. To be honest with you, and then dumbing it down for the average person to be able to synthesize or synthesize is better than dumbing it down. It's yeah, synthesize I mean, it and simplify. Is that correct? Yeah. I like boiling it down, right? Like reducing stuff. Let's call it cooking. Cause that's like what everybody's saying. Let them cook. Yeah. Now. Let them cook. Um, I, mean, yeah. I heard this from my daughter recently. She's in volleyball. Let, I'm like, yeah. what are you talking about? She's yeah. Not yeah. So yeah. Nick's honestly, like I, I will, I'll have to give Nick credit. Like he's really good at stopping me. Like you remember those lemony snicket books where like you'd be reading and then he would say like some word that nobody understood and then they would like define it. So on our podcast, we yeah. have this thing called the Nictionary where like I'll say something that like makes absolutely no sense. Cause like, I'm just like, just wrapped up in that like consultant jargon. I'm, I've gotten a lot better at it, but I, I'm actually not good at, at boiling it down. Nick is exceptionally oh, okay. good at taking so complex he... topics and making them very accessible for the, for the lay person. So you're a good team. So tell Nick, tell me about yourself then. And so that before we jump into, I'm going to, I got a couple of topics. So I want to talk about the, you, how you guys built a podcast, what you've learned and also the housing market, you know, what you guys are thinking is going on with the housing market and mortgage rates right now. Cause I know you'll have some, some sound bites on that. Go ahead, Nick. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. I appreciate, appreciate that, Dan and, and Scott. Great to be back. I think I was on your podcast, uh, maybe two, two plus years ago. So it's been a while since we've seen each other. Um, yeah, very, very quickly about me again, obviously non traditional, non, non linear background to, to get where we are today. Uh, background in, in small businesses. I'm in my mid thirties now. I've been starting small businesses and, and businesses since I was about 18. Um, 
university and then went to college for construction engineering technology, spent a couple of years on the construction side of things, uh, on, on condo developments and, and an institutional, uh, level, uh, project management, then left that career to spend some time in commercial real estate in downtown Toronto, uh, jumped around, kind of went corporate for a couple of years and then sort of buying rental properties, Got my mortgage license and have since built up a, a rental portfolio. Met Dan. We started a podcast. Uh, it sucked. We started another podcast that obviously didn't suck uh, and have since kind of been uh, just a number of different things over the last couple of years from from commentator to content creator to event host, speaker, um, still do mortgages. That's kind of my, my primary income. Um, but uh, yeah, just just kind of all things real estate and Really love the world that, uh, that Dan and I have kind of created and, and been a part of and, and all the amazing people that, uh, that have come along the way with us. Right. So that's awesome. Happy to be here. Happy to be back. Yeah. Th- thanks, guys. So, okay, let's talk about the Canadian housing market first because there's lots going on in that right now. And so, uh, uh, Daniel, you said something about you've been predicting a crash for 10 years. So is, is did I hear that correctly or were you joking or? I was being a, a facetious for sure, okay. but, uh, you know, like they say, the perma bears, they're like wrong for 10 years straight. I, I, I was, I'm, I've always been a, unnecessarily bearish. I think I'm actually just like a natural contrarian. I can't help myself, but to like feel, right. which is, is good if in some ways, that, but it's that kills annoying Twitter, probably because Twitter is like, oh, yeah. yes, it's negative, baby. We're going <laughs> to like, I just got on there recently and I'm, I'm like, I, I gotta, yeah, I find it. Yeah. It's, it it's, does it's, until, until like now I, th- now I'm starting to feel that everybody's too bearish and I'm like, I'm almost like kind of want to be bullish a little bit. And now, <laughs> All of a sudden, I think Twitter is just a very negative crowd, to be honest with you. I will right, say, right. like, you know, Twitter, uh, Twitter, Reddit, anywhere where you, it's very easy to get an anonymous account. I've noticed that brings out the worst of people. Like, oh, it, yeah. an- anonymity is not an infrastructure that human beings should have been offered, I think. Okay. So, housing market wise, then, I, well, let's ask you the interest rate announcements tomorrow. The show is going to come out after that. What do you guys think is going to happen with the interest rate? Either one of you guys can jump in there, and then I'm going to talk about housing market. I'll say 50 bips. Okay. Yeah, I'd agree with that. And do you think that, like, how many more of these are we going to see in this cycle? Do you have any ideas on our, like, uh, yeah, thoughts on that? I think the terminal um, rate to the downside is probably uh, 3%. And terminal rate overnight means rate. to, to you know, yeah, n- overnight rate it when they're done. done. Yeah, when they're done cutting, the end of the rate cutting cycle will be 3%. Okay. Two, if, if if things are really bad, two point seven five. I can't see them going further than that. Yeah, that was kind of the what all the big banks, all the different economists had come out with a with a study that uh, they predicted anywhere from two seven five to three two five. So I, I'd agree with Dan. I think we I think we kind of land right in the middle of that at, at three. I, I'd be more comfortable with with something in you know three and a half kind of thing. I think that's probably a better place to stop. Um, we seem to have have raised very quickly, too quickly, and now seem to be cutting very quickly and potentially too quickly as well. It's been a interest rate roller coaster ride for sure. So let's talk about the housing market. So as you guys are, I'm sure the housing market is regional. So it's, you can't just say, "Hey, house prices are going up," or the condo market's getting destroyed. Although I think it is in Toronto, but uh, <laughs> it's. Uh, it is regional, so maybe let's talk about Ontario specifically, and then we'll we'll talk outside of that. So, what are you guys seeing in the Ontario market, and what are your sort of expectations in the near term? Um, yeah, I mean, Ontario condos are an obvious headwind. Um, I, I would say that uh, we're we we got to be pretty close to the bottom here. I think that the remaining challenge that Ontario will be facing, and this is this is something that would be scalable nationally, is is unemployment, right? I mean, if you look at the way that interest rates move through the economy, um, typically housing is impacted first because it's forward looking in the way that people need that credit to purchase a property. And so you saw when the hike when the rate hiking cycle started, basically everywhere other than Calgary, uh, prices dropped almost immediately in Q1 of 2022. Um, and, you know, nationally like that was the biggest house price drop everybody's always saying oh like prices are going to crash it's like what more do you want like they that was literally the biggest house price drop that we've ever seen in canadian history especially right. in ontario um 
So and this so, is the contrarian view you're speaking of. It's kind of like, hey, wait a second. Did you not just catch this? If you pay right. the math, you're yeah, like, yeah, guess, yeah. Yeah. Like, because some people are like, oh my gosh, it's going down lower. But, you know, maybe like, but yeah, I don't like for me as a, as a, as a bear that satiated my uh, need for doom. And, right. you know, I mean, that was bad. Like it was really bad. A lot of people lost everything. And, mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, we saw like Canada's a very volatile housing market. We saw the same thing happen in, 2016 in Vancouver uh, after their foreign buyers ban. Same thing happened in 2017 in Ontario when they did their non-resident speculation tax. Um, and then, you know, and, and this still exceeded that. And and so that those are the moments that kind of made me bearish on, on Canadian real estate when I was talking about how I've been bearish for a long time. 2017 is something I called exceptionally well. And I was like, and then COVID started and it got out of control again. And, and I realized like that we're just repeating the same thing. Um, so anyway, Ontario you're probably like, you're kind of at that point. If you go back and look at the last housing cycle uh, in the nineties, 89, big drop. And then it kind of like just bounced along the bottom for like four years after that. It, it took till like 94 for prices to actually start meaningfully trending upwards. Um, nationally, the same story other than I think Calgary just being a big outlier, to be honest with you. Right. Okay. And then Nick, what are your thoughts? Uh, yeah. You know, I think you brought up a really good point. Scott, that um, it, it's really hard to paint the country with with one brush, let alone even even the province of Ontario. You know, uh, essentially along the four hundred one corridor from from basically Cornwall to Windsor, one in four Canadians live there. So the data is is completely skewed. It's it's almost impossible to compare uh, markets like a Winnipeg, a Saskatoon, a Regina to to you know a Hamilton, a Kingston, etc. You know, I think it's it's really difficult that, and that's why researching and and looking at the data and formulating a proper investment thesis for whatever you're trying to do, whether it's literally buying your first condo, your first town, your first detached, your first duplex, uh, it all goes back to the data. So, um, you know, it's very easy to say that, yeah, Toronto from a condo perspective is completely screwed. I don't think anyone's going to argue with that. Uh, there's still deals to be had in other markets and other pockets within the city here from a multiplexing standpoint. So, uh, very loaded question that, that I don't think I can answer in, in any kind of simple format other than to say that, uh, you know, do your research and, and know your markets and, and have a formulated investment thesis for whatever it is you're trying to accomplish. Right. And different strategies work better in different markets as hundred percent, sure, as you guys yeah. are aware. Uh, where do you think the investment opportunities are now? So if I said to you, I'm going to give you there's a million dollars of your grandma's money. <laughs> this is gonna be a really you're gonna be like, I'm not even gonna do real estate, but she you have to put it in it's from a trust and you have to put it into real estate. And where would you guys put the money? I'm gonna ask Daniel and Nick, and you guys may have different answers, and that's fine. But if you had to put it into a market right now, what would you do? Geographically, like um, Yeah, like so what it would it be like, you know, I was in Moncton and this front some of these smaller markets are doing really well. Like, you know, yeah, St. Like John's Moncton. Newfoundland. I like I like St. John's. I think I, I I was a big Saskatchewan guy, but we went out there and I wasn't super compelled by the returns. Um so I probably would say like uh I, I really like Newfoundland, like um I think St. John's is a sleeper. I think it's population growth hasn't been modeled in. Everybody's just expecting the population to die off to, to say it harshly because it's an aging population. But I mean, rising tide lifts all boats with Canada's population growing so substantially. You, you feel the magnitude of that most in the smallest cities. Yeah. I, I noticed that too, when I was out there, I was out there not long ago in St. John's and I was there 18 years ago and the uh, immigration is increasing the population of St. John's. It's not because of procreation. You know, people mm -hmm. are, it's well, so no, no city down. in Canada is going up because of birth rate. Like we just hit the record, right. the lowest birth rate in history. Right. What about you, Nick? Where would you put your, if you had your grandma's money, that million dollars that you got to put into investment properties? I got to call my grandma, see if this is, uh, um, it's okay. We won't tell her. We, we won't yeah. tell her. I'm just curious. <laughs> um, you know, again, I, I think it really depends on on strategy wise. Because a million dollars in Toronto, you can still like we're like a partner of mine. Uh, you know, we, we're we're seeing decent returns on on multiplexing properties. So it goes back to strategy. I I I love trying to pick a market that um, that no one's really talking about, but that has a lot of uh, leading indicators for future growth and major future potential. So I'm I'm always trying to you know look at the Look at the the overlooked markets, like the you know uh, some of the Prairie provinces, Winnipeg, Saskatoon, Regina. You know, I think Edmonton has, is now really hot because Calgary got too hot, so people are driving a couple hours north. 
Um, you can't talk about real estate right now without hearing about investing in Edmonton. So for me, um, you know, not that there's not deals to be had there, but I always try to be, you know, one step or half a step ahead of, of other people. And um, I would be looking at the prairies or, or some of the East Coast markets now. Okay. And I didn't ask this question to you, Daniel, but what would you, what would type of thing would you be looking for? Like a fourplex? Would you be looking for a single family with an up, down, or like what, you know? Um, I, I think small multi is probably like the least competitive space right now. Like I think above five, you've got, you're competing with the, the CMHC buyer and like you can see the impact of that on cap rates uh, across the country. Um, and then I think, uh, below or like once you get to even two units, um, you're kind of competing with the marginal buyer, like your end user, right. You're competing with homeowners. Yeah. I think like that, that three to four is where you really get the best deals to be honest. Can you, uh, okay. I, I think I understand why the cap rate is affected by the CMAC buyer, but maybe just tell our audience if they don't understand what you just said there. Sure. Yeah. So CMHC MLI select basically allows people to spread out, well, to, to, to go up to a 50 year amortization. And so, um, you know, I mean, when you're p- spreading out your principal payment that substantially, you can you can still cash flow. You can still hit the, their debt service coverage requirement, which is low, by the way. Yeah. Um, at a you know, a, so you can do that on at, at a pretty low cap rate. Right? You can purchase at uh, I don't know, like you're seeing guys do execute deals at three high threes, low four cap rates, right? Right. Um, so you get you get a combi- combination of factors, but super low amortization or sorry, super low down payment requirements, uh, lowest interest rate in the market, longest amortizations in the market, um, and so then that's really just basically pushed valuations up because the buying power that you can or the amount of property right. that you can afford to cash flow is stretched out a lot. It's interesting how the certain government programs can dramatically affect segments of the market. For sure, yeah, and I I think that that one's visible, like at on the cap on the at the national average cap rate level, that's visible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, from uh, yeah. Anyways, I have some I have some thoughts on that in the U.S. or some things that they're doing that I think is actually encouraging a lot of these large companies with a lot of money buying single family homes because they can. And maybe you guys know this better than this is my theory, and I'm not 100 percent on this, so I might be out of my depth. But you guys can educate me. Uh, So, from my understanding, you can roll over capital gains. Again, my American listeners are like, and I can't remember what it's called, a 10, 20 something rollover. 10, 1031. 1031. 1031 rollover. So then you don't have to, you take your winning, your winnings, your earnings. And so you've got companies that are sitting on a lot of cash and they're buying, it, they can actually, it's kind of like they're playing with house money. If you don't have to pay tax, you're better off to put the money into something. And that something happens to be a bunch of single family homes, which then drives prices up. What are your thoughts on that? So my, is that like totally whacked or? I, I'll, let, I'll let Dan answer that, but I, I, I do want to say I love how that was a perfect Freudian slip of instead of win, your, your house winnings instead of your house earnings. I think that, that's very, <laughs> well, that's, very fitting. That's, yeah. yeah. Your winnings. Okay. Sorry. Go ahead, Dan. What, how would you, what would your thoughts on that? Um, yeah. I mean, I don't like, I don't know if uh, large institutional scale capital is super competitive in the in the single family like detached housing in in the u.s as it was sort of at the early onset of like i think it's less your your exit scenario and your in your bull case is a little bit less pronounced than it was in in a super low rate environment where you basically could imagine prices going up until rates started coming down sorry rate until rates rates started going up um so i mean it, it definitely exists what you're describing but i don't know if it's uh Okay. Systemic. So I don't know if it's systemically impactful. Well, no. S- sorry, I thought you were asking like if um if like the 1031 is causing all of this like pool of uh, investor capital to go play in the single family residential market. So we're yeah, yeah. That's what I. That's that was my theory, or um, you know, unproven, unscientific theory was that is this actually? Because if I was an investor and I got money that I if I if I sit on it, if I take you know I'm going to pay tax, but if I can roll it, I'm going to keep moving the money and doubling down. If you know. That that's just the, um, yeah, that was yeah. my thought. But I guess the other thought I have, the question I have on this is just for my own. Uh, you know, you guys are smart, so smarter than me in this stuff. So I hear like companies like BlackRock own like fifty nine thousand homes in the U S. So like, what's causing? And this is a you know, what's causing these big companies to buy so many single family homes? Well, it's a good investment, I suppose, and and they've figured, and and you know, it's interesting. Like at the 
the last housing crash, Warren Buffett said that if he could figure out a way to do it at scale, he would have, he would have bought as many homes in, in the U S as he possibly could. And these mm. folks just figured out how to do it. Um, and I think that, you know, as you get to, I think technology has made it a lot easier. I think that like, you know, especially on the acquisition side, I think like a lot of people think the management piece and stuff like that is the challenge that the challenge is acquiring, um, thousands, 59,000 unique properties. And I can tell you, cause I've been consulting with some folks that are doing it at scale in the Canadian market. Um, it's it, the acquisitions and underwriting and making sure every deal makes sense is the harder part than figuring out a management system. Um, right. so that's probably why they're doing it. They've cracked the code and it was always a good investment. It was just like, and, and, okay. and realistically, I think North America is heading towards the renter's economy. And so, um, somebody has got to do the, the, the the landlord job right okay that's good I, I got out of my depth there sorry listeners I, if you you anybody listening to this who's got any knowledge and this is going to punch all kinds of holes in my crazy idea but i thought hey why not, why not chat with you guys about it so okay we talked from the canadian housing market a little bit the the um we talked about what you guys like to invest in interest rates you think three percent is terminal rate and i got one other thing i want to ask about before we talk about podcast you guys have a, a very successful podcast which i'm as a po- i've been doing podcasting now for 10 years and I don't get anywhere near the download numbers you do, uh, but I, I may, I console myself with the fact that I have an extremely niche audience that hopefully makes up for the fact that I'm, it's not the, the numbers like it's, uh, but what that's about the such a blessing rules? to be honest with you. <laughs> um, oh yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, I think it makes it easier in some ways. Like I never wanted to compete with Tim Ferriss or something. Cause I'm like, I'm never going to compete with people that are doing business and stuff. It's like, I have to go super narrow, but yeah. Um, so I'll come back to that. But NAR rulings, what do you guys think of these NAR rulings? Have you given that any thought? Do you have any opinion on that? You know the Yeah, I mean uh Nick, do you have any thoughts? I I know I've been I've been hogging the mic here. So No, not at all. I mean you're you're the realtor, Dan, so I I I want you to chime on this uh regardless. You know, Scott, we uh, I'll say a few things. We did cover it a little bit on on the podcast when it when it was coming out earlier this year. And Dan and I looked at each other, I can't remember if it was on on air or off air, but we're like it's only a matter of time until this 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 kind of stuff creeps into Canada. Um, and it's like and fashion; I think, everything it does eventually work its way across the board. Like for, I know more for sure. U.S. politics than do Canadian, unfortunately, because it's just yeah, so think, much. Louder. I don't think you're unique in that in that sense either. Right? I think that's just that's just probably most Canadians, right? And I think I think with you know we've already started to see some some stuff happen with with Korea. Um, so I think you know it's an emerging story. I don't want to I don't want to comment on it too much because I by no means am an expert on it. But I, you know I think the Canadian real estate in general and and just the Canadian economy is is about to go through. You know as Dan said, we're headed to a renters' economy. I think we're going to go through a renaissance period. I think we've seen mass exodus of real estate agents, mortgage agents. I think we're seeing a huge exit, and and that's kind of you know probably forced out not a lot of those are by choice um i think we're, we're seeing a huge turnover in uh, uh a lot of people retiring from from construction and trade so we're kind of on the precipice of, of essentially a new world order when it comes to canadian real estate in general and this is just perfect fitting time for for something like this to happen a big lawsuit to shake things up even further and potentially change commission structures or, or the way that business practices are, are happening within within real estate and i'm probably going to get some flack for this and scott you and i got to be careful because a lot of our business i'm sure comes from real estate agents but uh you know there was their best practices really went out the window for a little while there and and um i think it's it's going to be a, a big pendulum swing back to understanding fundamentals real estate professionals being professional uh mortgage professionals being professional and uh yeah, again, I, I, I'll leave it there and I, I'll, I'll let Dan jump in because he is, that is his side of the business. But, you know, I think, um, I think the States is, is a leading indicator for whatever happens and, you know, things got shaken up there. So it's inevitable that it's going to happen here. Yeah. What are your thoughts, Daniel? Um, I don't know if our justice system is as, um, with the consumer as the U S so <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And, and so I think that it's unlikely that we'll end up with a, the same resolution, but I think we'll, we'll end up with some sort of similar, uh, I mean, look, the, the reality is that in, industries evolve and, and technology ends up being a reason that that takes place. Um, 
innovation is deflationary, right? And so it should bring costs down. And and we're I think we're just finally seeing the point where people are fed up with paying certain prices for the real estate to the to, to the real estate profession for a transaction that many people feel that they can do a good portion of, of the work themselves. Whether or not that's true doesn't really matter. That's that's what the consumer thinks, right? Right. Um I don't I don't think um I actually don't think it's. I think that the the outcome is good. I think that it force it, it it rewards good agents and it will and it punishes bad agents. And so I think that that's actually going to result in a better quality for uh, for the end users. I think it's going to result result in a better industry for for the good the good agents. And I would hope that we actually end up going along the same path as the as the U.S. We do have copycat lawsuits happening all over the country now, and and um, the Competition Bureau recently put out something where they were. Uh, it was like a call for people who have had experience with uh, those um, like FISBO programs and and flat rate programs, I guess, to get an understanding for the experience. I think they're kind of fishing to see if realtors are, are blackballing those um, those listings. I think that's kind of what it sounds like. But mm, um, interesting. Yeah. So it'll be, it will be interesting to see the resolution. Um, but I, I'm. I'm hopeful. I think it's, it will be good for our industry and I'm not afraid to say it cause I don't, you know, I don't sell to realtors per se, but also like, I think that y- you all sell to good, you all sell to good agents and, um, They'll and good, a- yeah. And good agents will, will win from this. They might mm-hmm. not think that at the beginning, but they will. That's the truth. Because that's just in their DNA. You know, the, I love that line. Innovation is deflationary. I've never, uh, that's a, that's a tweet right there. You probably have said that before, but that's a, I have never thought of it that way, but you're absolutely right. Innovation yeah. is deflationary. Yeah. Um, you're, you're correct, Nick. This guy's got lots of good ideas in his head. So, you know, one of the things I thought about what the things I think about when I think about this NAR rulings, one is that when I see the average person trying to negotiate for a toaster on Facebook marketplace, they're absolutely, <laughs> t- they're terrible at negotiating for themselves. And so the only concern I have is people going, I could do this myself and then get completely filleted by a listing agent because that person's a professional negotiator and they are not they're they're playing poker against somebody who knows what they're doing that's mm-hmm. one well, thing that's, that's just yeah what are your thoughts that's on just that? darwin well it's just darwin <laughs> there's some coming coming out you know playing out in, in in real time so if that's the case and and people's egos get the better of them and and they don't feel the need to uh you know don't use your 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 uncle who got his real estate license or whatever because you know he's trying to do a family deal kind of thing but it just goes back to, to, you know, doing due diligence, using professionals and, uh, you know, those professionals have built trust and reputations in the industry that, I mean, listen, the three guys on this call, the, probably the best things we have going for us are our reputations. I could ask you to, you know, uh, any type of question, would you be willing to risk your reputation for? And the answer I think would always be no. Right. So it's not, it's not um, worth the money. Like it's not no worth way. it. Right. So, yeah. um, yeah. Yeah, I think it just comes down to working with good people, as it always does, and, and always will. So I'd love your guys' thoughts on this. So because this is uh, this is a n- different than typical typical podcasts that I do, but so I think when I, this in our rulings, I, I always say who wins in this scenario, right? So I think institutional buyers who are buying at scale because now they're they can maybe they were able to negotiate better deals because of their situation, but they certainly have an advantage when there's uh, no uh you know buyer agent fees and then the other one would be the platforms these large platforms like zillow and because they have the inventory they have the system in place and so what are your guys thoughts on like who the you know yes the good agents are going to going to do they're still going to be fine but who else wins when with this sort of this new rule change i think first and foremost the consumer wins which is a good thing okay so explain exactly just basically you said before about how it gives them freedom of choice and, and yeah freedom uh, of choice i think it's it's it started the conversation like even if even if circumventions are introduced it started the conversation to the point where like it's kind of like at the beginning of covid when um you know mortgage deferrals took place and then you know your tenants would come and be like oh i heard you don't have to pay your mortgage so do i have to pay my rent like you know when like new rules are introduced it starts the conversation about right. changes um right. and so you know I don't. I can't imagine a, a reasonably well-informed home buyer not, is is not asking their agent about this in 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 this day and age. And so you know, you give it several years of of time under tension for this to actually take place, and in the fullness of time, that is le- likely to materialize in some sort of innovation that makes it um, 
easier for agents to transact at, at lower fees. Maybe you start to see some lower fee models. Uh, you certainly have a greater degree of transparency for the consumer on what the fees that they're paying even look like. You start to, you know, actually be discussing, if not removing some potential, um, conflict, conflicts of interest. And so I think that the consumer, um, the consumer gets a little bit of a competitive advantage and a lot more transparency, which is, I mean, if you really think about the way the real estate industry is structured and not a lot of people are going to like this one, but, um, it's we're really just, about, that's, we're, we're all about that today. There's yeah, a few clips yeah. from here that I'm like, Oh, let's send these out. The people are going to be like, Oh my gosh, we're going to love this. Sorry. Keep going. Yeah. So, I mean, real estate is a, it's a business ba- ba- uh, built on asymmetrical information, right? So mm-hmm. somebody has more information than somebody else. And, and, that that barrier apparently is worth five percent right in Canada or three percent or four percent or whatever it is it's six percent in the u s and and um that like we're in a in a, in this digital age this knowledge revolution right this uh, you know you hear about the industrial revolution this is a knowledge revolution you can go into chat GPT and learn ev- anything that you possibly want, but somehow there's this this wall between what a seller knows and what a buyer knows or what a realtor knows and what a buyer knows. And, and, and this is, this is like a brick being taken out of that wall, right? It's not mm-hmm. the whole thing, but it's a brick being taken out. And I think that that, I, I mean, look, if we, if we want to progress towards like perfectly competitive markets, we need to have, um, the, all, all the correct information. And, and I think this is a pretty honorable attempt to get closer to that. I, I got a friend who was, had some, so back to the knowledge asymmetry of information and the knowledge revolution. So he had one of his family members had some benefits that were getting taken away, like an insurance benefit. So he went into chat GPT and wrote it up and said, how do I negotiate to give mm-hmm. my benefits longer? And it worked, came back, gave yeah. him the whole thing. He put it in an email and they gave him another six months. So there's an example of using the technology by just asking the questions. I was like, yeah, that is genius. I would never thought to do that. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I think that that's like the sorry, yeah, AI, AI the the AI like the fact that you injected that in the conversation is interesting for, to me because like as soon as you put the real estate board information on that on that platform, and I'm I'm working with a group who's kind of like exploring those those types of things right now. Um, it's out there, right? Like th- their example wouldn't be an example of that, but like somebody at some point, the all of the data that it, that belongs to the real estate boards is accidentally going to cross that line and and end up on a on a chat gpt but then it's gonna come down to who's got the best ai negotiating bot it's like i've got my negotiating bot is negotiating with your ai negotiating bot and we'll see who it's like a video game or something yeah or and or like when you think about the way technology like i i think about technology as like especially with the real estate profession everybody thinks that the end game for real estate is like uber right it's like i just buy and sell my house directly on some app it's like no it's too complex of a transaction for that let's just set that one aside yeah what if it's more likely to end up being like uh, CAD, right? CAD stands for computer assisted design. To me, you can give a realtor a handful of tools and make them a computer assisted real estate agent. Care, it's a great acronym, it's super sexy. Somebody should should trademark that. I just and bought, then they, I just bought the domain. <laughs> just yeah, and that, and then, and now all of a sudden, you've got an agent who has technology is doing all the things that technology should be doing. I don't know what those tasks are, administrative things, et cetera, whatever they're capable of in five years, maybe, I don't know, exploring other galaxies is probably what AI will be doing in five years. But um, the agent has no, like if all of the agents administratively are, are at this on the same playing field, now they have to f- forge some sort of other competitive advantage. And to me, when you're all assisted by the same technology, it's like similar to CAD, the drafting, the way it replaces the drafting table, you either have, as a realtor, you either have results or or service, right, or customer service, and that that to me is where you start to see these benefits for the for the end user, right, the the consumer of, of real estate services, um, where you say, okay, my agent has to stand out in order to forge a competitive advantage and be better than whatever um, other agent is out there, or they can race to the bottom, so they can rate, compete on price, they can p- compete on results, or they can compete on um, on customer service. Sorry, that was a long right. winded answer. That was a good question. Oh, and, ask, and I just but, wrote down computer assisted broker. You got to get your cab, you know, like, yeah, the same. It's the same deal, man. Okay. Yeah. So let's talk about Nick. I want to ask you about your podcast. So you guys have a podcast uh, that you grew from 6,000 a month to almost 100,000 a month. And as a guy who loves podcasts, I've, I've convinced numerous people to start podcasts. I think it's a great way to, if you have a message <clears> or a story, you want to interact with your audience. But what have you learned? What are some of the lessons you've learned doing what you guys have done at a significantly bigger scale than what, what I've done? Uh, yeah. Um, 
lessons about about podcasting or, or just all like anything you about think business. Of. So if you had to give me, what's your three? What, so if somebody's thinking about doing a podcast, this is my question. I'll make it more. I'll make it more specific to help you. If, yeah. What would be the three okay. pieces of advice you would give somebody? And I'll come to you, Daniel, and see if you have something different to say. But what would you say is the three pieces of advice to someone who thinking about have? I think a podcast, whatever that is, would be useful for my business. Uh, yeah, great, great question. And I've, I've answered this one numerous, numerous times as well. Cause I think, I think podcasting can be, I mean, uh, before years before Dan and I had had our first one, let alone this one, which is, which has done quite well. I, I was consuming podcasts and still do it, consume it probably more than any other form of, of media. Um, you know, I think the first thing I'd say is it's, it's going to take time. Just like with any business, just like with anything that anyone embarks on, uh, get used to it sucking and, and being very difficult for, for a while. Don't let that deter you. You know, um, Dan and I do some, some coaching and, and get solicited for advice on, on business and real estate all the time. One of my favorite quotes to drop to people is, uh, everyone overestimates what they can accomplish in a year and underestimates what they can accomplish in a decade. Now it doesn't have to be a decade, but just keep persevering. So that that was the, that'd be the first thing. Second thing is don't try to be all things to all people, right? You're not Joe Rogan, you're not Tim Ferriss. Don't try to be uh, niche down, Scott. You you said not so long ago that um, you know you you f- you found yourself in a very very niche. Uh, well, guess what? I used to listen to you before I became a mortgage broker and I still do. Um, you know, and, and I sought that out. And the more researchable you can be, the better SEO you can have, the better, you know, the more successful you're going to be, right? That's why we came up with the very creative name of the Canadian Real Estate Investor Podcast. It's because very people, obvious what it is. It's like, well, oh, I e- want that. Yeah. Exactly. Right. I love mortgage brokering. Okay. Well, if I type in mortgage brokers, you're going to come up. If you type in Canadian real estate investing, we're going to come up. Um, okay. So, just as a side note, what was your previous, your first podcast that didn't work as well? What was the name of that? Just because uh, I want, if this yeah, is a good so, object lesson in being for sure cl- clarity over clever. So, yeah. So the first one was very clever. It was called brick and mortar, you know, right? Classic real estate term. You know, it was red brick bracket background. Dan and I both love red brick stuff for some reason. And, uh, and, and I think it, I think it was also, um, the third piece kind of ties into that as well. If, if you're going to do something and, and you're starting it now, right? Like Scott, you've been doing this, as you said, for a decade, right? You've got a loyal audience. You've got an audience that is going to tell other newer people to listen to your stuff because it helped them as they, as they got started. Um, and that would be my third thing is, uh, so don't, you know, you've got to, you've got to find, find that niche and, and, and stick to it. And, and, you know, by sticking to it doesn't mean just like, you can't, you can't, you can't be just doing the same content as everybody else. Right. So if you're just going to have people and you're going to interview them, you got to make sure that those people that you're interviewing are, are delivering value, right? I mm-hmm. think that people have such a short intention, attention span these days. Mm-hmm. You know, Dan and I try to keep our episodes in around that 45 minute mark. And we just try and we, and we script ours to a certain extent because we want to make sure that we are delivering enough value, enough social currency and enough, um, you know, real data and real information that people are going to get that value and keep on coming back for it, right? Like when we embarked on this journey, we're like, hey, we're not, you know, out of the 240 episodes, we've had probably had 25 guests on. And uh, and that's by design because we were like, you know what, this is going to be way more work to do it like this, but no one else is really doing it in the sense of, hey, this is like real estate school. Um, Right. So that would be kind of my third piece um, of, of advice for anyone starting a podcast, you know, pick, pick your niche and, and again, commit, right? Like if you're, if you're going to agree to do this and you're like, Hey, we're doing one episode a week or two episodes a week or, you know, two episodes a month, don't miss them, right? Like people are going to come to expect you're going to become part of people's daily, weekly, monthly routines. The minute you go cold or, or take some time off or whatever, I guarantee your listens will drop and it'll be harder to come back from that. So yeah, that's good. I'll, I'll, okay. I'll leave it there. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to you next in a second here, Dan, but I'm just going to recap that. So three piece, play the long game. So the pers- perseverance matters. What I was told when I started my podcast is that most podcasts die at six episodes. So I recorded 10 before I even launched because I was like, well, at least I love it. I got yeah. further than that. That's awesome. Uh, focus on a niche and then focus on really adding value because that'll create the re- repeat customers. So what would you say your answer to that would be, uh, Dan? I know. Sorry, yeah, Dan, I, think, I, took, I took most of the good ones. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. I, I got, the only thing I would have to add to what Nick said is um, decide early what 
what, if you're doing this for for fun or if you're doing it as a business. If you're doing it for fun, that's fine. Enjoy it. And like just focus on having a good time with it. If you're doing it as a business, treat it like a business. And this is like the same advice I have for everything in 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 life to be honest with you. Like, you know, e- even relationships I, I would I would apply this logic is like there should be clearly defined uh, you know like a, a partnership agreement as an example in 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 business is is very much a a, um, a document on how to fight um, and, and how to settle disputes. Your biz- if you're if you're going to start a podcast as a business, what's your goal? What's your like? What are you actually? aiming to get out of it. Okay. I'm, I'm aiming to get leads. Okay. Well, where are you aiming to get leads? You're, you're aiming to, like for us, we don't get, we don't use it as a lead gen platform. We get, we monetize our podcast through ad revenue, right? We have advertisers, some of the, some of the, the, the most celebrated, uh, companies in the world. We're very fortunate in that regard. Um, but if you're starting a, a, a podcast, like a niche that Nick described as an example, maybe the Toronto real estate podcast, right? And I think that there's room in the, in, um, the national scope of podcasts for a, a local podcast, like a local niche podcast be, uh, okay. I'm my, my goal is to generate leads. I'm going to treat this as a business. What would you do? What would be the next step? You'd build, you'd write a business plan. You'd under, you'd want to understand your customer, right? KYC. Mm-hmm. Who's your customer. And then understand, think about your customer's needs and then communicate directly with them. A lot of people make this mistake when they're, making content and I make a lot of content. I make thousands and thousands of videos and and audio per year. They speak as if they're speaking to a room full of people. Like they're up Mm, and you're not, That's good. you're speaking to one person. Like no, never, ever, ever, ever. Have I ever listened to a podcast? One time I listened to a a true crime podcast with a friend on a long drive. One time I've, and with one other person, never have I done it with a room full of people. Everybody says, Hey, everyone, Hey, it's, it's, it's Mm -hmm. speak directly to your audience and know them as intimately as you can. And if you can create like little groups of your audience where you can say, Oh, I'm speaking to the first time home buyers, then address them. This is for you, the first time home buyer, right? And and the person who's not the first time home buyer just shuts it off. Oh, that's not for me. Right. Um, so that's like the most important part it, from my perspective is if you're going to do it as a business, treat it like a business, know your customer, understand their needs and deliver something directly to them, not to them in some room full of imaginary people, just, just them. That's what content is. It's one, one on one. That's the social and social media, right? But it's one to many. It's, it's, but it's still one to one. You know, I, well, that actually is. So I, when I, I tell people about writing emails, the best emails I write, I think of somebody, I picture them, I'm writing an email, say, I'll write, Hey, Nick. And then I write the whole emails if I'm writing it to Nick to a, send it to a whole bunch of people, it does way better than if I write it to the group because nobody pays attention sure. to the group. Yeah. Uh, like you can't, you, you know, I've like stopped using like the, Hey, everyone thing, even in like our, in our course, like only mm-hmm. one person is reading the thing and on, on, you only need to address that one person. You've never, ever, ever had an opportunity before in history to speak directly to one individual person at scale, like to sell at scale to one person at a time or sorry, like as if we're, as if I'm selling to you one at a time to a thousand people at a time, like when has that ever happened? No, it, it has. It, it hasn't. No. And it, yeah, that's, that's really good. Actually, I think I, I need to approve at that. I think that's something this might take away from this conversation. Uh, so I'm going to quick your recap, determine your why really decide if it's for business or for fun, know your customer and focus on talking and communicating to that one person and not to a whole bunch trying to, cause it just, it always comes off weird. You're right. It's like, for sure. Hey guys, it's like, yeah. who are you talking to? It's just me. It's just, you're right. 99% of the podcasts I listen to are by myself. Yeah. So uh, that's really good. What, did, one last question. When did you, how long did it take you guys to monetize your podcast? Mine was like 18 months before I got my first sponsor and it was very modest, but I was so excited. I was like, I got somebody to pay for like offsets of my costs. So how long did it take you guys? Well, I mean, our old pod, like I, I was, I was doing a podcast for like, uh, I think it was started before COVID. So 18, 19, 20, 20, 20 six years before I got, uh, like before like Nick came along and that was, um, and then, so, so six years for me before like Nick and I started the new podcast, to be honest with you. So, and, and, and I probably never would have really, like I wasn't, it wasn't going anywhere. I just really enjoyed doing it. I didn't realize that, but that, like, that's, that's all it mm-hmm. was for me. Right. Cool. Well, where can guys find, where can people find you online? Canadian real estate investor podcast on, uh, on Apple, on Spotify, uh, 
uh, find me on on Instagram at my buddy Nick and and just type in Daniel F O C H and he'll pop up on on just about everything. Uh, so yeah, we're we're pretty easy guys to find. We 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 host cross country meetups as well for for kind of in person podcast listeners. Um, so go check us out on on meetup dot com. Just type in the Canadian Real Estate Investor and uh, twenty four cities over forty two hundred members across the country which is which has really been an amazing thing that that we've done and and we do that all for free all the events are free to attend we're really just trying to you know revolutionize a, a kind of a a gap in in the canadian real estate space um really make a, a welcoming and, and just overall chill environment for anybody whether you're a legacy investor or, or a completely new have you know planning on buying something in the next couple of years real estate curious so go check out those events and then we also do a lot of other free stuff uh check out real estate we do monthly free webinars and a free kind of education program with with uh the ability to to hop in and and get some premium stuff if, if that's what you're wanting to do so there's my little plug that's, really, right that's awesome and we'll yeah. put links to everything in the show notes thanks guys for coming to chat with me I really it was great to, to connect with both of you Thank you so much. Keep on fighting the good fight. Hey, thanks again for listening. And hopefully you got some ideas from my conversation with uh, Nick and Daniel. You know, the they gave some great advice on the podcast. And I'm going to work on talking to one person. I naturally do this when I send emails, but I think I sometimes forget about doing that when I'm actually talking in the podcast. So you can call me on it if you see me doing the hey guys thing. Shoot me an email and say, hey Scott, like what are you doing? So I think that's a brilliant uh, takeaway that I got from my conversation with them. And uh, also, so one of the things that we are looking at doing with uh, Island Mortgage Broken Community is doing some more live meetups where we're going to do some sharing, some ideas, some masterminding. If you're interested in that, shoot me an email. I'll make sure to let you know when we're doing that again. And I'm looking forward to connecting with some more of you guys. Thanks again for listening. As I always say, there's no problem in your mortgage business that someone else hasn't already solved. Your problem is who's got the answer? Hopefully, this podcast provides you some of those answers. Thanks again for listening. I'm Scott Peckford, and I will see you on the next episode.